Hello watch enthusiasts. Now today, as is the case every month, I have a video on the best value vintage watches this December. And there are quite a few which are offering unbelievable value by comparison to, to what they, they offer in terms of features. With everything from, uh, from the incredibly affordable from 5 or £10 through to, um, to one of the most well-known Rolexes um, of all time, and indeed one of the most revered, but nonetheless one which is remarkably affordable by comparison to its modern counterpart, and yet interspersed with, with interesting oddities from the past, with curious stories and interesting innovation. However, for today's featured picture from the, the Snups group, I have this wonderful picture from BJ Moose, which is this fantastic, uh, fantastic gold-toned 37mm chronograph from the 1960s. With, with these wonderful Dauphine style hands and this large bicompact layout, as well as this, um, the, this dial with those wonderful Art Deco numerals, and, uh, and also the, the details of uh, Ibush Suisse at the bottom of the dial, suggesting this is a movement which was Swiss, um, but the rest of the case isn't. Which is a curious aspect of vintage uh, watchmaking, they had far more, more, um, more, manu more manoeuvrability in terms of what they wanted to place on the dial, and the way they stated what the watch was in terms of its, um, its origins, which is all the more interesting for this timepiece. And of course, for those who don't know about it, um, do, do feel free to follow the link down below and join the Snups group, um, which is uh, it's called The Watch Guys, and is, is a, um, a, a setup whereby uh, over 9,000 uh, individuals who are interested in watches can now post pictures of their collections and interests and ask me or indeed any other viewers um, or indeed any other members of the, the group questions on these wristwatches um, or indeed simply discuss horology together which is a wonderful thing and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll join to be able to really get the most out of the channel. Now the first watches I'd, li I'd like to talk about are from Timex and these are Timexes from the 1960s and 70s and these are watches which I think offer some of the best value on the vintage market and have gained a certain popularity since the release of the new Timex Marlin. Now what these vintage Timexes offer the individual is a timepiece which in today's world is, is rather beautiful and, and delicate in its design. But at, at, at the, uh, the time of production these watches were very much a utilitarian watch for the masses. And so they come with a simple three hand setup and a date in either stainless steel or indeed uh, base metal. And you do also have some which are, which are gold plated. And these watches have an incredible price range of between about £5 and about £110 for the much rarer models. And this makes them exceptional value if you're trying to get a mechanical watch out on a budget that will be both elegant and interesting, but you won't have to worry about too much and that you can truly wear as it would, would have been worn in, in its era. And these watches in terms of sizing are always on the modest size, with sizes generally between 34 and 36 millimetres, which means they won't be for the, for the larger wrists, unless you, you like a small dress watch, which I must say is, is a very delicate and interesting thing to wear from time to time. And so for the average £40 which these, these watches cost, you are getting an incredible amount of watch, with it attractive detailing on the dial as well as uh, nicely made cases, albeit if they are plated, um, the plating is, is um, liable to, to, to coming off over time, but I must say at this price range that really isn't a concern. They also offer mechanical manually wound movements from the era, which are curious and, and interesting to, to have in a watch, because you do have a greater involvement with, with the owner, um, as the owner rather, of the timepiece. And I wouldn't say these movements are any, in any way inferior to the movements seen in the modern version of the Marlin, which is uh, simply a, um, a reappropriated Seagull uh, um, ST6 movement, which, um, which is very much in line with the quality of these sorts of movements. As well as that, Timex offer, offered quite a, a great range of these with the different dial options and different case options, with everything from very simple dials to much, much more complex ones with, with gold and, and blue on them, which can be quite a remarkable sight to behold, especially at this price range. And so I think these rather interesting little pieces make really fantastic options as far as, as very, very affordable dress watches go, because I'm acutely aware of the fact that uh, the, vast, the, the vast majority of people simply can't afford uh, watches that are worth a few hundred pounds, and I can understand entirely. And so it's wonderful to see vintage watches which are affordable and available, especially in spite of things like, for example, um, the, the, the Rolexes you see selling um, for, for over a million pounds for these extremely rare models. And, um, and it does bring things, I think, back into context that you can get these rather wonderful little pieces for a fraction of that price. Now, the second watch in the list is seemingly very similar to the Timex. And this is the Omega Seamaster DeVille from the mid-1960s. And I appreciate that I often talk about the Seamaster, especially the vintage models, as being su superb value, really. But this particular model is a bit different from others, because this model is in many ways a very stripped-back alternative to the, the more well-known 1960s uh, large lug Seamasters. Because this was a model which, uh, even today, um, after being, being seen quite a lot, actually, on the vintage market, still remains very much underappreciated. 
because this is a manually wound dress watch which is significantly slimmer than the other Seamaster models, but still retains the build quality and the beauty of those models in a, a more dress orientated package without any of that additional sportiness. And this is the manually wound watch with a, a 601 uh, movement usually, or any, any of the 600 line of manually wound movements are really tremendous options for someone who wants a slim dress watch, but with some history and, and a real heritage. And with regards to the variations of this watch, there really are quite a few, depending upon the dial variant and indeed the case. But as a rule, these are 34 or 35mm watches, with the vast majority of that being the dial, which does lead to an aesthetic which is, is very much in line with, um, with a watch which does appear like, for example, my Longines Conquest Heritage, where the dial takes up the vast majority of the case uh, real estate, which means that it does appear much larger than it would normally seem, because the dial is actually an equivalent size to, for example, a 40 or 41mm dive watch, simply without all that additional case around it. And that makes these watches f uh, appear far larger on the wrist, uh, if you happen to have a larger wrist, making these watches a very interesting option, and uh, in many ways more, more wearable for larger wrists than, uh, than the, the thick lug Seamasters, just because they had a slightly smaller dial and, and more case around the sides. As well as that, uh, you, you get these beautiful sunburst cream dials, which often have aged and, and patinated in a wonderful, wonderful way, with applied indices and, and that typical Omega logo of the era, which is applied and has those little flares on the sides of the style of, um, of logo, which just look absolutely fantastic on this watch. And these watches do come in a number of finishes, as is really always the case with Seamasters of this era. The steel ones are the ones I would personally recommend, because they'll be the easiest to maintain and, and keep up in terms of, um, in terms of uh, finish maintenance as well as the fact that uh, unlike the, 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 the coated version, so for example the gold-plated models, the wear will be more minimal and, and less noticeable. As well as that, the fact that these watches were really the ultimate um, level of dress watches means that unlike other models from other brands around this era, things like, um, uh, like uh, Pole Routers um, from Universal Genève, as well as the other Seamasters and even, even uh, Rolex um, Oysters, these watches will generally be in much, much better condition, with really almost immaculate dials in a lot of cases. And this is because they would have been worn really always under a dress cuff, which it make, really works wonders with a watch if it's not actually worn in, in testing circumstances, as these watches weren't. And this means that you can really appreciate the detailing of these watches the way they were in their day, with a fantastically decorated case back, and a beautiful dial and general case aesthetic with that wonderful domed hess like crystal. And as I've said, these watches feature the Omega Calibre 600 line of movements. And these were in-house calibers from, uh, from Omega themselves, which were manually wound, meaning that you lose the thickness that would be added by having an automatic winding system, making these watches incredibly slim and wonderful to fit underneath a cuff. As well as that, these movements from that era of Omega, um, uh, Omega production from the 1960s, these, uh, these movements really were at the pinnacle of Omega's quality. And Omega were known for their extremely high quality in movements, um, really until that point, until the early 70s, when I think their movements, uh, most people will agree, took a, a turn towards a far more utilitarian design, and didn't quite have the exacting quality of the 1950s and 60s. And this only really returned in the, in the late 90s with regards to their non-chronograph calibers, because of course they always placed a lot of emphasis on their chronograph movements, with perhaps a little bit less emphasis on their automatic uh, three-hand models, and indeed their manually wound versions. And so for a price of about three to six hundred pounds, you're able to get a watch which really is a, a masterpiece in terms of a, a classically inspired dress watch. And as well as that, the movement is easily serviced, but also has that exacting quality of Omega of that era, which is really a win-win scenario. As well as that, this watch allows you for the price, or rather a fraction of the price, of one of Omega's heritage or vintage-inspired models to get the real deal in terms of a piece which will be in extremely good condition, with a movement which is easily serviced, and, and with an aesthetic beauty which is really unbeaten to this day. For the third watch in this video, I would like to talk about an yet another manually wound watch. And this is the Tudor Oyster. And that's not to say the, 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 the automatic version, but rather the manually wound version with a, a, an, a, an ETA movement. Because this watch is a very interesting piece in many ways, because it plays off the style of the um, of the, 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 the automatically winding icon that is the, the Oyster Perpetual from Rolex, but offers Tudor's uh, take on this and also provides a case which is slimmer, more refined, and in many ways more versatile for daily wear. And of course in any form, the, the Oyster case is the ultimate everyman's watch. It provides elegant design, which we've come to expect from Rolex and Tudor, as well as a very wearable design with that sloped bezel, the, um, the, the very simple case profile, as well as a water-resistant package, which is also um, perfectly dressy if you do want to dress it up and wear it as a, a formal timepiece. And so as a result, this version, which is the manually wound Tudor Oyster, offers an enormous amount, 
because it's available in, in various year specifications, so really everything from the, the 50s models, which look far, far more, um, more sketchy, if you will, and in many ways more delicate in terms of the number of features on the dial, with rail, uh, rail track styles of, of indices around the, at the edge of the dial, and, uh, and also loomed hands, or later versions with the squared off hands and, and far more, uh, more date-just um, uh, types of aesthetics, which I think add enormously to, to your, your choice when you buy one of these giving you the option of going for either an earlier model or a later model. But what you can count on with these watches is they will have reliable and easily serviced manually wound ETA movements, which will be less service in terms of pricing than the equivalent Omega movement, they won't have quite the refinement. Equally, the lines of these cases are really very, very beautiful, and in many ways are, are, are very well associated with the style that Rolex are known for. And these on the earlier models have far more cu cu curved lines from the, the case sides to the lugs, whereas on later models they follow a design which is much more similar to a modern Rolex uh, Oyster, with their, the, the sloped and, uh, and very carefully curved polished sides and brush tops to the lugs. Of course, with these watches one has to look out for over-polished models where the corners have gone, but generally these models follow similar lines to the other watches in this, in this review, whereby a lot of them haven't been used very, um, uh, very, uh, very, very often, and have been used as far more for formal timepieces than their automatic counterparts, and so as a result these days are found in much, much better condition. The only area where I would always say to be careful with these watches is in the, um, the condition um, of the, the, the crown. Because of course this has been used far more than, the, the, than an automatic crown, because it's been wound every morning, the seals in there will often have deteriorated, and often the threading can be a little bit more ropey. And so as a result, it's always worthwhile buying these watches from a, a seller which, uh, which accepts returns, so you can be sure that really that everything is alright, or at least um, uh, work with, uh, within a service uh, which uh, certifies that um, if you're not satisfied with the product, you can return it for a refund. Really, the greatest wonder of these watches, though, is the design, which is of course completely timeless. The, the curves, the lines of this watch, as well as the dials on the later versions with the sunburst effects in greys, in creams, even in blues sometimes, you can get some fantastic effects and some looks which simply wouldn't be possible um, from uh, from a lot of other brands because whereas um, a lot of other brands take the view that you should produce m multiple different watches, Tudor and Rolex have usually followed the, the idea that you produce one type of case but rather you, you go mad with the variations on them, hence why you can get so many curious and weird and wonderful versions of the Rolex Oyster, making this watch a, a tremendous way of getting into that, that ecosystem without spending two or three thousand pounds on, for example, a vintage um, Rolex 1601 or 1603, but with very similar user experience and enjoyment. Now the penultimate watch in this video is a curious piece in many ways, because this, this Hoyer um, uh, 980.006 is a piece which is in many ways overlooked, because it doesn't represent really any of the values we would come to expect in, in a luxury or indeed good value vintage timepiece. But the real reason why this is an interesting watch is because this is in many ways the watch that saved Hoyer from bankruptcy and, and disappearance altogether. And the reason for this is that this watch was devised um, as, as the, the model 844 and 8440 um, for the automatic and quartz versions in 1979. And this was after Jack Hoyer had spoken to a, a number of, of dive firms who found the quality of dive watches simply wasn't up to par with the, the price they cost. And so as a result he set about producing his own. And this was the fruit of his labours, a 42mm dive watch with a, a case with this protected crown, this uh, unidirectional bezel, and this generally Rolex-like aesthetic, which works extremely well to provide a watch which does, um, does serve the purpose extremely well. Similarly, the watch was designed to be, to be quartz in order to, to avoid the use of its crown to the greatest extent, to increase service, uh, service intervals between seal changes, which is a, a quite an interesting concept, and actually returns to the, the ideas of Panerai, in the 1940s with the idea of having eight-day power reserves rather than the shorter power reserves in order to minimise the use of that crown. And whilst the automatic versions of these watches, um, the 844, cost an enormous amount more, the quartz versions are, are fairly attainable with prices which are, are generally um, in a range which actually, considering the history of this watch, make them remarkably good value. And the prices of these range from really 900 to 1500 pounds, which does seem a large amount at first, but when one considers the history and the heritage of these watches, it actually seems very reasonable in my eyes. And these watches became the 980.006 in, in 1980, and when their, their naming changed, and indeed the automatic version remained the 844. But this model exhibits a, a matte black dial with that wonderful original Hoyer logo, and that, uh, that, that white luminescence on it. 
as well as that it does have Mercedes hands, which do appear derivative of, of Rolex, but certainly were in keeping with the, 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 the no-nonsense tool aesthetic of this timepiece. As well as that the case was unbelievably robust and, and rugged, with these very, very um, uh, substantial um, lugs, as well as this very large amount um, of coverage on the crown with those large crown guards. Additionally, this watch was, was designed around the idea of quartz being the, the best option for a dive watch, and so as a result, in many ways, I feel the quartz watch is the, the most true to the original model. As well as that, it does feature a, a unidirectional bezel painted uh, black with that uh, aluminium bezel insert, which again is in keeping with the style of the dive watch as a whole. And of course, as far as sales go, this was the watch that saved Hoyer from bankruptcy. And even when they changed over to Tag Heuer, they still faced difficult financial situations. And so these watches, with their 42mm case, in, um, in either steel um, or two-tone, as well as a, gold -plated, a fully gold-plated model, paved the way towards, um, towards the Tag Heuer, which um, has been known in disrepute, really, until very recently when they've, um, they've started to make some really very impressive watches over the past uh, five years or so. But this certainly led into a phase where actually Hoyer could certainly rest on their laurels, simply because their watches were, were so widespread in terms of their appeal, which is a stark contrast to the near bankruptcy they were facing at the end of the 1970s. And so in many ways I think this is a tremendous timepiece and a very interesting one at that, with its, um, its, its Swiss quartz movement, 200 metre water resistance, and generally rugged case, as well as fantastic history. And knowing this is the watch which truly was a turning point in terms of the history of this brand, which provides you with a story which is 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 um is f so far beyond anything you can get from uh, from any other brand in terms of history at this price range, I think these offer a really fantastic package for someone who's very uh, in interested interested in the history of horology and the development of brands throughout time. Now the final watch on this list comes into much higher price, and this is the Rolex Day Date. Now the day date, or rather the president, is often associated with the very highest echelons of the, the world of, um, of the, the vintage Rolex, or indeed the modern Rolex, because this was really the, the pinnacle of their luxury section, with these, uh, these solid gold in either yellow gold or, or white gold models, with day date um, uh, indicators at, at 12 and, and 3 o'clock, giving this watch a perfectly balanced but extremely functional level of, of quality and the fact that this watch's price was held up by the fact it was never ever sold in any, any other metal other than gold or, or in, the, in the end, platinum. But the thing is, these days, the new model will cost between 21 and about £23,000, depending on which model of the 36mm version you get, um, and that's excluding any diamonds that, uh, that you happen to, happen to want to have on the watch as well. However, a vintage model, and that's to say the reference 1803, um, which was the model um, during the 1960s and 70s, will set you back under £5,000. Now this comes across as fairly remarkable, bearing in mind the fact that these watches are not so different in terms of their, their functionality, with the possible exception of the fact that the old day date doesn't have a quick set date or, or, or day of the week. And in fact this, pr this price can be reduced to under £4,000 if you go for a model without the bracelet, which is something which further increases the value of these timepieces. And these watches come in the very traditional size of 36mm with a wonderful fluted bezel, all in, in uh, 18 karat uh, yellow gold, or indeed white gold. As well as that, the dials are fantastic things of beauty, being designed as the very most expensive of the Rolexes of their era, with these sunburst patterns and effects, as well as various colours, and even if you really hunt around, and these do come in at a higher price, um, of uh, really about double the price of these, you can get uh, semi-precious stone dials, which are also absolutely sublime, such as a uh, lapis lazuli being used quite extensively for those blue dials, which looks absolutely tremendous, and, and, uh, and if you can get hold of one of these, they really are worth it. But the reason why I say this is such good value is because by comparison to the, the modern watch, a watch which in terms of aesthetics and in terms of functionality is very, very similar, except has a better history, is significantly less expensive. I mean, you, you can you could get four of these, uh, over four of these, for the price of one modern day version. And internally, this watch features the calibre 1556 from, from Rolex. And this is a movement introduced in 1965, which offers this day-date complication, and it's an automatic 26 dual movement as well, with a beat rate of 19,800 beats per hour. And so this is very much of the classical style of Rolex movement, but does have the potentially problematic issue of not having a quick set date, which means that you can't set the date without setting the hands, which can be time consuming if you don't wear the watch every day. However, for those who do see this as a problem, if you spend uh, about £2,000 more on one of these watches, including the bracelet, you can get hold of the 18,000 uh, 18, references rather than these, um, the, these 1,800. 
and those were produced after 1977 and feature the later calibre 3055, sorry, with 27 joules and, uh, and, and a quick set uh, date and day. And these versions come in a slightly more modern style of aesthetic and don't have quite the classical charm of these older models. But nonetheless, still for about £7,000, you're still able to get a fully-fledged day-date in beautiful 18-karat gold with some of these fantastic dials and some of the best build quality in the business. And so as a result, I think these watches make excellent options as far as vintage watches go this month especially. Uh, bearing in mind these are particularly good value at this time of year, simply because a lot of people don't really um, see the point of, of wearing these day dates for the for the 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 the, uh, the fact that they're um, they're inconvenient to keep in terms of the the, the day date function not being quick set on these versions, and so as a result, their 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 pricing is remarkably low, which makes these really incredible value and, and a tremendous tremendous thing to own for anyone who is fascinated by vintage Rolex and would love to own a, a more high end Rolex for the price of a steel date just which I think is absolutely remarkable and makes these watches truly tremendous value as far as Rolexes go. Anyway, with this gorgeous looking day date, I'll conclude this video here. But uh, do leave a comment down below as to what you think of this video and indeed what you uh, you think uh, I might have missed or indeed what you liked about the, the models in this, in this video or any preferences you have, because I'm always in interested to hear your opinions. So thank you very much for watching and please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel and to be able to enjoy more content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Armand the Watch Guy. Over and out.